you're tuned in to Shake, Rattle, and Gold, the official podcast of your Springfield Thunderbirds. Echoes there on the backhand, scoring the save, rebound in the crease, they score! Hosted by Matt Baker and Steve Forney. A show that's everything Springfield hockey, with interviews including players, coaches, and staff. The Springfield Indians repeat as the Calder Cup champions. Listen to this podcast on all major streaming platforms and wherever you download podcasts. In his first year at the helm, Kevin McDonald and Drew Bannister have the team in the Calder Cup Finals. Watch the podcast on the official Shake, Rattle, and Goal YouTube page at SRG Podcast. And now, here are your hosts, Matt Baker and Steve Forney. In this episode, number three of season two of the Shake, Rattle, and Gold podcast is proudly brought to you by our friends at White Lion Brewing in Amherst and in Springfield, by our friends at Brewcade in Agawam right there on Walnut Street, and by our friends at Landscaping That Fits. You can give them a call at 413-847-0338. Alongside Matt Baker, I am Steve Forney. Matt, how are you, my friend? Good, Good to do this again. Oh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's been a busy, uh, busy day tonight, busy evening, but uh, doing well. Excited for the show tonight. This whole week is completely bananas. Yeah. You know what? We do it. We do what we do. Yeah, we find our time. We do. Um, so we do have a lot to get to. We actually have a our first uh, team uh, player guest uh, coming up in a little bit as well. We're going to talk to Scott Harrington, defenseman for your Springfield Thunderbirds. Yeah. Um, we're going to recap some of the games. We're going to look forward to some of the games coming up. Uh, but I think we both agree that we need to start with the elephant in the room, which is our fr- fine friends at Flow Hockey. Yeah. Now, when we had uh, when we had their general manager on, uh, Jeff, right? Um, yeah. So when we had, yeah. yeah, when we had Jeff, Josh, on, Josh, uh, Josh, Josh. Sorry, sorry, Josh. Sorry, Josh. Um, you know, I, I remember saying, if this doesn't work. I'm going to be, I'm going to be ticked off. I'm going to be a little annoyed. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you what, I was, I was pretty annoyed. Um, I think that there are some things that fans kind of need to understand. Let me just at least give, give my perspective on yep. if, if they're not getting any signal or any feed from the arena, if their internet is out, there is going to be no replay the next day. Like mm-hmm. if you miss it, you miss it. It's gone. You can't, it's not like they can now. Could they have asked Hartford? For their feed, right? Like I just like everything that goes in the jumbotron in any arena gets saved somewhere. Could they have reached out, gotten that file, popped it up on the website? I don't know. Maybe could have. I don't know. Um, I think my biggest disappointment is that you're th- this is the top of the top for them, right? Like they have USPHL and they have all this other hockey or these tiny little rinky dink rinks that they can get a signal in. This is your th- this is the cream of the crop for you. Why are you trying to access the same internet that Jimmy up in section 115 is using to stalk his ex-girlfriends on Facebook? Like, why are you like, you should have, you should have a flow hockey strictly own wireless connection in every single arena. Is that a lot to ask for 32 separate wireless connections? Yes. You know, it also is a lot to ask 160 bucks for a year long subscription. So this, that part, I don't understand. Now, if you want to, If you want to bang on Hartford for that, that's fine too. In Springfield, we have the MMC guest wireless network. We have the MMC employee uh, wireless network. We have a strict, strictly a wireless network that is only for the off ice video review camera. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's three that I only that I know about right there, right? So, Hartford, the XL Center, massive place. Why do they only have one source of internet? I don't know, but I'm trying to rely on that to me from Flow Hockey is, is disappointing. And, um, you know, and I, I had the same frustrations everyone else did. The problem was that game was so bananas that it would cut out. It would come back. Two goals were scored. You're like, what happened? And of course they don't update the, the ticker in the top corner still says one, nothing, but the scores two, two. Yeah. Um, I don't remember there being any wireless issues with Hartford games in the past when it was AHL TV. I don't remember a single issue. So it's not like this has been a recurring problem. So I, yes, I, I totally understand fans frustration. It's unfortunate for flow hockey that it was like kind of the first tune in game for Thunderbirds fans. I mean, right. everybody, everybody was watching that feed waiting for that game and everybody had the same issues and everybody complained. Um, so that's sort of just my take off the top. I'm, I'm a little disappointed in in them and 
Hartford as well. Get get your internet situation figured out, Hartford. Come on. So I'm I'm with you, and and very well said. Uh, you know, you're you're asking fans to up their ante and up their investment into your product. You better make sure that your product is is up for the challenge. And it, you know, all things try to be fair about it all. You're right where this was the first away game. So you have all of the, all of the, the season ticket holders, you know, this is part of their package and this is their first experience with it. I mean, I at least missing the, the, the kids club opener on Sunday was able to watch it. So I knew flow hockey worked. Now I, I, this might be irresponsible of me, but I'm going to be irresponsible. I don't completely buy it all being on Hartford. Um, I mean, I'm not a tech guy, but the XL Center, I mean, that's home to women's UConn, women's basketball, Big East tournaments. They host big time events there. I can't believe that they're not they don't have enough again. And I'm not a tech guy. So Band, I, I might bandwidth say, bandwidth might be right, the word like, I, I, thank you. Yeah. I was going to say like <laughs> internet power. Like I don't, right, yeah. right. So I, I don't buy that. They don't have enough bandwidth for flow sports. I, something was there. I also, when we had our conversation with Josh, one thing that I thought was good is that this got tested 15 minutes before things started. I'd like to also believe though, that, they tested things out prior to the season starting. Pri- How do you not know you're taking on this massive deal with the AHL? And you're right. The AHL has got to be, at least from the flow hockey standpoint, it is it is the biggest selling fish. point. It's the biggest yeah, fish they got in their pond. You no, know? yeah. and and I know they they dive into track and field and everything, but I, I I would I would bet confidently that at the end of the season their numbers are driven up from ahl more than track and field or you know so how you don't know that every arena has the same capabilities to to stream on your platform that's an oversight by someone if that that's really what happened um but you know, it, it. I had no issues watching the other games on Flow Hockey, so I'm hoping this is a one-off. We'll find out very soon. Uh, you know, we'll talk about it at the end of the show, probably. Um, they end a three and three this weekend in Hartford again, so we will soon find out. But I, I don't know. Our, our buddy Al Armand did. He, he's kind of been our sleuth. Right. He's been digging and doing a lot of investigating and, and going back and forth with emails from Flow Sports. So thank you for that, Al. And he's been trying to keep us updated. And, and again, I'll be honest, I apologize. I don't quite understand all of their explanations. But basically now we're finding out that their platform also doesn't isn't compatible with some smart TVs. Or I have a Roku stick, so me I stream too. off of a Roku stick. So yep. for me, I, I was it was very easy for me to download the app, sign in, created my account, paid for it, and I was good to go. Other than this, the other than the Hartford game, I hadn't had any hiccups with Flow Sports. Um, but apparently now there are certain smart TVs that it just doesn't jive with. I, I don't. I, again, I, I apologize. I, I'm not the person to talk to about that stuff, but I would just look fans. You're, you're understandably upset. I was pretty upset. Um, I commented on social media a little bit Friday night. Cause again, like, and I'm sure people can relate to this too. Like it's Friday night. Hey boys, let's rush home from flag football. Everybody shower. We had a nice dinner. I got popcorn in the microwave and we're going to sit down and we're going to watch our first Friday night T-Birds game. And then I'm like, well, I guess we're not doing that. Um, and so it, it was a major letdown. It was a bummer. Um, but hopefully it was a one-off. And, uh, you know, like poor play, you get it over with at the beginning of the season. 
you work out the kinks and smooth sailing from here. I hope. I, I really do hope. Well, it is just funny that the hockey gods did it this way because, again, it, it could have been any arena in, in, in the league. And it happens to be the home game, or the away game of the team who had the general manager on their podcast. Right. Like, I don't think the Grand Rapids Griffins had Josh on their podcast. We had right. him on, and then it's our game that kicks out. So yeah. the hockey gods were there. And, you know, and again, Al, uh, thanks to Al, because I, I told him the next night, I said, Al, it's, you know, seven, whatever, sometime in the seven o'clock hour, go on Flow Sports from, you know, from your section, your seat, and see if the Hartford Bridgeport game works. Mm. And it did. It worked great. See- so, the, so the next night, the game worked fine. No other game prior with AHL TV, I ever remember there being a, a, an issue like that in Hartford. Yeah. So that's why when you say I, I don't, you're not bl- putting the blame all on Hartford. I tend to agree with you. Yeah, and I was I, talking I, to people that were like, "Well, I'm I love I've been watching Flow Sports for ten years because I love racing, and I've never seen an issue, and it's not their fault." Blah blah blah. And I'm like, "Okay, well, this isn't racing. Like, this is game number one of a brand new partnership with the AHL. Like, yeah. what is going on here?" So. Disappointing. Look, I, I hope disappointed. I hope at the end of the day it was someone's fault, right? And and we can it's I think it's fair to be disappointed and upset. Anytime you're a paying customer, you expect a certain level of of return in your investment. And clearly, uh that game was not it. If it's a one-off at the end of the season, we forget about it and it's not a big deal, and we're all happy with flow hockey and we're good to go. And and but you know, if this is something that and I'm going to be paying attention, and, and I'm sure when this happens, you know, in Iowa, or this happens in Bridgeport or wherever, right? Other fans are going to be upset about it. I'm, and and we'll see if this if it's something that again, for whatever reason, an electrical storm, the Northern Lights affected Hartford's. Well, you know, right? It's if it's a ten feet ten feet of snow in Utica, I get it. Right. You know what I mean? Like, but it was. It was a beautiful Friday night. There was no. Yeah. So you know. I, 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 I just, I call, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I got one eye up on AHL or I'm sorry, on flow sports, kind of putting it on all on the XL center. Um, because again, that, I mean, I love the Thunderdome, but even the, I mean, the XL center is, is a huge draw and I, I can't buy that it's, they just don't have capabilities just on a Friday night and then Saturday night they do. Right. Like, and, and the team, the team knew it was 15 minutes before puck drop and the team, the Thunderbirds team tweeted out, there might be some disruptions, you know, stay close to social media or listen to the game yeah. on WHYN. So like they, they, they got the heads up before it all started. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Fishy. Uh, if you ask so, me. Yeah, me too. Um, we, you might be asking, why didn't we get Josh on to talk to him about it? I just, I didn't want to have the guy on and just berate him. Yeah. You know, I mean, if he wanted to come on and clear the air, I'd be happy to do that. Um, but I wasn't going to reach out to him and, you know, give and him again, the, like give him the business, it, so. it, it, it's true. Again, I think you, and you brought up this point. This was our first opportunity to watch a game season ticket holder fans, right? This was your first. So your first opportunity was bad. It's a bad look, hundred percent. But in, you know, in February, if we don't have another hiccup like this, you're not looking. You're you're over this, right? So totally. if it happens again, I, I I I'm not, and I'm with you. Like I don't think it's necessary to bring him on and complain about one game, um, out of five, honestly. Uh, yet, yet. We'll hold them accountable if, if necessary down the line, um, you know, and, and maybe at some point at the end of the season, we'll ask him how everything went and we'll ask him what happened in that Hartford game, like right. for real. <laughs> um, but I think at this point, even at our, with our podcast, sometimes our internet goes out, right. And I freeze yep. or you freeze like it, that's so sometimes that stuff happens. Um, but as a paying customer who doesn't have an option, you either pay it or you don't you either watch your Thunderbirds or you don't. We want to watch our Thunderbirds. I I completely understand the the bad taste in in our mouths because it's in mine too. Um, but I'm just hopeful it was a one off. Yeah, that's the hope, and it, that's what it appears to be. Um, mm-hmm. Again, it you know some some dude went out to the arena and forgot that one really important chord you need. 
Yeah. And you know, as somebody who does, you know, I work in broadcasting, you do remote broadcast and you get out to a place and your battery's dead or mm-hmm. uh, I forgot to bring a, a mic cord. Like there's all right. And like when we do our remote broadcasts, that's why I like, right. I, I have a list and like a checklist and, and I, I'm checking that thing five times before I even leave the house just to make sure I got everything. So I'm bringing, if I need two or something, I'm bringing four um, for that reason. So, you know, it is what it is. I think, yeah, I think fans have the right to be upset, but I do think that at this point it's, it's been long enough, uh, mm-hmm. you know, c- lower the, lower the body temperature a little bit, sort of get over it. And, and like you said, let's, let's move on and, and sort of get over it. So, um, but yeah, it was, that was annoying. So, um, after all that, uh, t- to recap the games, we can't even really recap that game because nobody saw the thing. Didn't uh, really watch. Couldn't watch much of it. I mean, <laughs> I know, I know Nikki scored. Uh, and I know D- Dylan Peterson had a couple, but maybe that's where we'll start. Maybe just an overall view of the weekend. Um, Dylan Peterson, I did not see this Amen. coming. Four goals in yep. two games. Um, this is the type of of gritty, head down, go to the net, find loose puck, grimy goals. And I think we've been talking about this. You know, this might be a team that scores a lot of a lot of grimy goals, and Dylan Peterson did, did just that all weekend mm-hmm. long. Yeah. Taryn Pfizer gets in the mix as well. Um, he scored. I, I, I again, uh, with it so choppy, it's really hard to comment on too much of. I mean, I think there were a handful of penalties that kind of were were frustrating as a fan. I again, I think um, a couple of the goals Zarenko's letting in. You're uh, again, I think you kind of would scratch your head on and be like, ah. You know, um, but Dalibor Dvorsky gets in the scoring column again um, in the third period. So, look, I, it, it was a gritty. It was a back and forth game. You end the first period and you're down 4-2. Uh, young team, you come back and you respond and you win the second period. Outscoring Hartford 2-1. to one. That's what you want. Um, again, in, a, in another team's home opener, you know, they're bringing the juice. So I thought Nikki getting off to that first goal early was kind of good to kind of maybe bring that the fan energy down, but then Hartford kind of scored two quick ones. Again, th- this was when I wasn't watching. Um, nobody was <laughs> unless you were there. Um, but the team responds in the second period, which is good. And then in the third period, you know, one tally each. So I, I think it was a back and forth game typical of what we're used to with Springfield and Hartford. Um, and uh, I, 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 you know, sorry, I wish we had more to, to really discuss on it, but I almost feel like it would be unfair to guess how Z played. We could look at the box score and see he let up six goals. I honestly don't know if they were good goals or bad goals. Right. I, I, I don't. Um, Cause there was even at, at, at one point and I texted you, I think it was in the beginning of the second period. I was just like, I'm out. You know, yeah. they had the, if I was holding on to hope, I don't, I don't mean to go back to it, but holding on to hope that, Hey, whatever it is, you'll figure it out in the intermission, you know, go to a black screen. It's intermission. We're not missing anything. Cut the power, reset the power, do something. I don't know. I was holding on to hope for that. So, you know, a few minutes into the second period, I just said, all right, well, you know, I'm, I'm calling an audible and I'm doing something with the boys. I think we ended up playing a game that night, but, uh, you know, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to comment. I, I don't know if they were good goals or bad goals It you, we couldn't watch it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't either. And you know, I, and we'll, we're going to talk about this a little later when, with our fan feedback, um, we had a, what, what did you call it? You had a nice name for it. The Monday, the fan rant, the Monday fan rant. I like that. Um, you guys gave us a lot of feedback. And if you're wondering what we're talking about, check out our Facebook page. I think we're going to try to put these out every Monday. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you guys can, can let us in on your feedback, but, you know, Zarenko gives up six and Ellis plays pretty well in back-to-back games. So, you know, I think that's something to keep an eye on too. I, 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 I'm not saying Zarenko stinks. That's not what I'm mm-hmm. saying. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I think, I, I think these goal two goalies might be closer to each other than we think. And mm-hmm. I think that's a good problem. I think it's a great problem to have. If your number two goalie is putting a little pressure on your number one goalie with yep. the way he's playing. Great embarrassment of riches, as far as I'm concerned. We should have good goaltending all season. I think, I think, and th- this was actually from um, one of our, our 
viewers on Facebook, Sean Miller, who says, you know, his hot take is that Ellis is, is the better goaltender and the team will find more success um, with Ellis than with Z. I don't, I personally, I, that's possible. I, I don't, I don't think it has to be a conversation necessarily of one is one is better. One, one is awful, right? Like I don't think any, and I don't think Sean is, is saying that either. Right. But um, I, I was surprised to see Ellis back to back. Um, I, I texted you. I was like, Hey, did you hear it of an injury or something like that from Z? But he was on the bench. He was dressed. Um, I, it, I think Zarenko is a top prospect of the blues and, and, has been for two years. It was, you know, one of the reasons why they were confident, I think, bringing Holfer up is they wanted to see what more they had in Zarenko. Um, so he is a higher ranked touted prospect than Ellis. But since Ellis has, has been here dating back to half a season of last year, I mean, he's been lights out. And and I even think um, Ryan mentioned this in one of the, the broadcasts his win loss might not be what you would expect it to be, but he's got a save percentage over nine, two. It's like nine, two, eight or something like that. Since he's been brought back up to the AHL, he does have moments again, dating back from last year. I believe it was against um, uh, the Hershey bears in the, in one of the games in, in the Thunderdome where he just had like back to back, lights out breakaway saves and sprawling saves. Um, I was critical of Ellis, his first game Sunday. I thought maybe a little bit too much more, you know, giving up some second chance opportunity shots. He cleaned that up and, you know, the win against Providence Saturday, he was lights out. He played great. And even Sunday against Providence, I thought he played well too. Um, I didn't feel like there were a lot of second chance opportunities just bouncing in front of the net. I think Ellis did a nice job clearing that up. So I think it's a situation if we have two good goaltenders. Yeah. Roll with yeah, a hot and, one. Right. And that's not a bad yeah. problem to have, like you said. No doubt. And yeah, he's he's got 25 AHL career games now, and he's got an, a 9-14 save percentage. So, I yeah. mean, that's, that's pretty darn good. Now, it's unfortunate for him. His record isn't great, like Ryan said, but I mean, I think he's – I really do think he's right there. So, um so record and like we we've talked about this last the the the, the nuance of goaltending and like sure it's 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 a team game and and the goaltender holds that win loss record but you know if you if you're losing games two to one one to nothing you know if you're if your team's not scoring points you could be lights out right um, and so you know I I don't really think there are too many opportunity or too many games that I can think back of to be like man. Ellis, like, and actually I was thinking of this too. I can't think of a game where Ellis was pulled. That's probably true. And and again, it, it I can remember games where Zarenko has been pulled. Um, Not always his fault, but I feel like maybe there's a little bit more of an even keel floor with an Ellis where he's able to not let the floodgates sort of open, so mm -hmm. to speak. Whereas, you know, he lets in two bad ones. He forgets about it. He, I'm good to go. Maybe there's a little bit something to that. Yeah. Yeah, very well could be. Um, just the mental, the, the mentality of it. I mean, also, he's not playing as much. So mm -hmm. the more you play, the more chances you have for for off nights getting pulled, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, you know, if you want to go jump ahead, if you were good on the, the game, nobody could watch. Um, <laughs> I was uh, I was really fascinated with the uh, Providence game at in Springfield. Um, there were a lot of things that I, I well, first of all, it was nice to see Matthew Pekka get on the score sheet. He had the uh, assist on the opening goal. I think my favorite part of the game was second period, huge power play opportunity. And not only did they have three rookies on the ice, but all three of them got on the score sheet with a goal from Silvergaard, from Johannesson and Dvorsky. Yeah. And it's like, you got a big power play. You got to break it out. And, and Connor Walchuk throws out a whole bunch of rookies and bam, they produce loved, 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 loved to see that. I think this team's young guys, once they start coming around are going to be excellent. I'm really excited to see Silvergaard progress. 
Uh, um, I, I, I'm just, I, I, since first game watching him, I'm like, Ooh, like it's impressive. And, and you can, I think you can see what he's trying to do where he's trying to sneak the puck and it just might not be getting there yet. And maybe it's some chemistry too, but I'm really excited. I was glad to see him uh, on the score sheet and, and produce on a power play. Uh, if he can get rolling, I, I I'm, I'm really excited to see what we have in Mil- Marcus Silvergard. For sure. So, um, Schooneman gets a goal. Peterson has two. That is uh, four goals in two games, as we mentioned. Silvergard um, in a 4-2 win. I guess the one thing that was slightly concerning, uh, first of all, that Fabian Lysel goal was nasty. And if you're a Bruins fan, you should be you should be begging Boston to call this kid up. Um, Why hasn't he? Look, I, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I know you're a big-time Bruins fan. I feel like he's been a thorn in everybody's you know what in the AHL for so for like th- three years now. Wh- well, they when, have they, what are the you Bruins, doing with him. Yeah, the Bruins because they continue to do well. They're kind of in the same situation St. Louis is where they have a bunch of four A players. Where yeah, you know, like why they went out and signed Riley Tufty, I don't know. They signed this kid Cole Kepke, who actually I don't think they had high expectations for, but is now playing for their fourth line right now is their best line and is the highest producing line. So you don't want to touch that. I, I think some of the guys that are dressed that can't be sent down. It's, you know, they, they're up the cap situation. So there's, there's a, a some strange reasons why, but um, I think the biggest one is if you pull them up, where are you going to put them? Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you on that goal, I couldn't tell if he was just ridiculously nasty or if uh, Tyler Tucker was a bit of a parking cone on that one. Mm-hmm. And I think that he still needs to get his skating legs going because again, he's a big dude and when you've got a guy like Lizell or Georgi Merkalov or um, who's the kid in uh, Birchport is shock off. You Ishakov. get these kids, you get these kids flying down at you. You gotta be, you gotta be ready. Right. Um, yeah. You can't just, you can't just physically move them. You got to stay with them. Um, so that goal was absolutely filthy, but um, I guess my only other negative takeaway are still the penalties. I mean, tripping yeah. cross checking mm-hmm. that, that boarding penalty by Leo Loof was bad. It was just, just bad, just poor timing. Um, luckily, they didn't give up any power play goals. Providence was over three, but still we got to stay out of the box. It's a momentum yeah. killer, especially at home. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was nice to see. And again, congratulations to Peterson. I just think that this kid's goals are so, so, so greasy. Um, he had that one where the, where Bussy was like laying on the ice and it looked like it was underneath him. Mm-hmm. And one of the, the goal judge actually came at intermission. He sits and we all kind of talk. And he goes, yeah, that, that puck was, he never had possession of the puck. He was wow. never actually fully on the ice. So he was able to, to nudge it through. Um, so a good awareness. Uh, th- I think this line with Drew Callen and Dylan Peterson is a, is a really, really nice, solid line. I think Kaskamaki's on the other side of that. Um, I'm excited to see that that line produced. And we did see a lot of shuffling from Connor Walchuk, especially in the top two, uh, top two units. So mm-hmm. I'm curious to see how this all shakes out. Again, when we talk to Scott here in a minute, Scott Harrington, I'm going to ask him about sort of the same thing that Tommy Cross said us said to us, which is you know how long until you know what your team is, yeah, because um, he's been around. So um, I do just want to to really quickly um, in one one of our fan ramp posts was about Dylan Peterson since we've been talking about him. This was from uh, Daniel Mason, um, just kind of talking about. Dylan Peterson and, and, you know, having four goals in the two games, but he mentioned he's on an AHL deal. He was, I I'm pretty sure he's on a, on like a two way deal. I don't think the the, the AHL, the way the rosters are are made, you could only have so many, you know, quote unquote veteran players with, I think it's like a few hundred career professional games. Um, and then the rest of your team has to be built with the two-way players. And then you're al- allowed a certain amount of just AHL contracts. I know Pekka is on just AHL. I know Sam Bitten is just on an AHL. But I believe um, Dylan Peterson, uh, who was a draft pick of the St. Louis Blues uh, back in t- 2020, the third round pick of the St. Louis Blues. So... I'm I'm pretty sure he's still on sort of the like entry level two way <clears throat> kind of deal, but you're right. What a what a pleasant <clears throat> surprise. And and 
that's another thing too. Who else in this young group of of talented, skilled players, aside from Dvorsky, who's getting all the attention as he should, who's that other guy stepping up? Who you know is there going to be somebody that kind of surprises us? A, a Dylan Peterson this weekend? Is it going to be Silvergard getting the ball rolling? Um, I'm, Tanner, I'm excited Tanner to Dickinson's see what's getting in the lineup. Yeah, right. Um, so a lot of young talent, and hey, this is their time to prove what what they can do, you know, and and continue just to progress. And one thing we haven't even really mentioned yet is that this team is without Hugh McGing and they're without Zach Dean, uh, Zach Dean um, right. who are both, uh, from what I gather, are not long term injuries. They're they're not going to be sidelined for a long time. But when right. we talk about like you said, young guys stepping up. Guess what? We need now. We need all the young guys we can get. Yeah. Um, they need to step up and fill those shoes. So it's good to see. Mm-hmm. You got you to mm-hmm. like it. Um, so we are going to look at the the other game against Boston, which we won't spend too much time on or against Providence um, because of the score. I, I do want to talk about though the three on the the three and three. Mm-hmm. And I do think that when you have, um, just to sum it up, when you have young guys who are not used to AHL action, and then you have guys that have spent a lot of time in the NHL, Alexandrov, mm-hmm. McKecker, and Ray Harrington. Now you have to, Harrington, right now you have to go back to three on the three and three, which right. doesn't happen on either side of that spectrum, right? So, right, I think that the three and three they looked exhausted on Sunday. Mm-hmm. I think yep. even Dylan Peterson on Saturday was talking about. He was talking about the the arena and how good the fans were, but he was like, you know, you get a three and three, and by Saturday your body's hurting already, and and that sort of planted the seed that like, oh boy, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. So um, we can touch on that game a little bit if we want to. We're going to look ahead and talk about some other things too. Um, we are going to talk to Scott Harrington here in a minute, uh, but before we do, I want to mention our friends at White Lion Brewing in uh, downtown Springfield and in Amherst. Um, I saw a guy handing out. Um, uh, flyers at the door to talk about white lion and their uh, parking. So park in the tower mm-hmm. square garage, go down to white lion. They're validate your parking for you. As you head into the match mutual center for Thunderbirds games. Um, and a, while you're there, get some of their food, their wings, uh, their beers. They got all kinds of awesome stuff going on there uh, by our friends at Brewcade in Aguam uh, right there on Walnut street. It's exactly what it sounds like beer, arcade games, uh, pool, all kinds of fun stuff. So uh, definitely check out our boy, Mike Sarnelli and everything they have going on. Follow them on Facebook and social mm-hmm. media. Um, you'll get a lot of good information there. And uh, by our friends at Landscaping That Fits. Uh, this is the fall cleanup time. My house is just a mess. These oak trees are killing me. The acorns are killing me. <laughs> uh, if you don't want to do what I have to do, call up Rob at Landscaping That Fits. He'll come over, do all your fall cleanup. As I've been mentioning, if, if you want to just pile it all up and you don't want have a place to dump it, just call him. He'll pick it up. He'll pick it up, get rid of it for you. Uh, and for a reasonable price as well. And he, by the way, he's also a really, really nice dude and um, is a big time. Uh, I think he's a season ticket holder. So yeah, uh, definitely worth uh, checking out and give him a call. 413-847-0338. And um, follow him on social too. give him a follow on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram as well, because he posts a lot of great stuff. So big thank you to those guys. And uh, here is our interview with Scott Harrington. And it's a pleasure to be joined right now by number 44, defenseman of your Springfield Thunderbirds, um, Scott Harrington, a guy who has seen a lot of NHL time, a lot of AHL time, and is now spending his time here in Springfield. Scott, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate having you. Thanks for having me. Good uh, good seeing you guys. Yeah, thanks so much for giving us your time, Scott. Um, so r- real quick, you know, Springfield just finished it up. Uh, they're three and three. Um, we missed you a little bit. Everything okay? Feeling okay? Yeah, just uh, dealing with a little um, issue that's kind of been nagging me for the last couple of weeks, and um, didn't feel great after the last three and or uh, the last the opening weekend. So, mm-hmm. um, just working on that every day, and hopefully be back soon. Nothing too serious, um, awesome. just something that um, you kind of want to clean up so that it doesn't linger and, and cause more time missed throughout the season. So, um, all in all, um, it's heading in the right direction. Good. Good. Good to hear. Awesome. Yeah. Um, now I don't. I know you spent a lot of time in the Blue Jackets organization, Scott. I don't think you were. Springfield was the was the affiliate there for a little while. I don't think that you crossed that path. I think you were a Cleveland guy. Um, yes. Is this is this is Springfield new to you? What do you think so far of the the city, the arena, the fans? Have you had a chance to do any interacting? Get to the casino? What do you think of the area? Yeah, it's been 
Great. Um, no, you're right. I missed it. Some of the guys that I played with when I first got to Columbus, they had been through the Springfield um, path to get to Columbus, but um, it was Cleveland when I was there. So this has really been my first experience with uh, Springfield. And honestly, it's been great. It's been uh, it's been fun. Fans are, are great. The building was rocking on the opening weekend and this past weekend as well. And, um, you know, it's a nice rink. It's a nice facility. Um, I didn't really know what to expect because I hadn't spent much time in Springfield. So um, the area is nice. My wife and I are really happy here. Um, we're just maybe like 15 minutes away from the rink. So um, everything's great, guys. Uh, we've got a good group, young group, you know, usually like the age show um, is these days. But um, we've got some experience, too, and a new coaching staff. They're all excited. So, um, you know, we've got all the, the makings for an exciting season. That's awesome. Scott, I, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, looking up, uh, you know, elite prospects and doing all my, my numbers crunching uh, this afternoon. And I, I noticed, right, so uh, you had in 1819, um, was sort of your best, call it statistical year, right? 73 games for the Blue Jackets, two goals, 15 assists, a plus six. Took you, like, you know, time to get there. You progressed as your game gets better and as your game develops. It took you a while to get there. You, you touched upon it. This is a young team and we're going to get into the defensive pairings and things like that in a little bit. But, you know, what are you trying to instill? Is there advice that you're trying to teach these young guys to, you know, keep developing your game? You'll get there. You know, you you are proof of that. You got there. Um, are, are they looking at you as sort of like, you know, you're wearing the A, but are they looking for more? how'd you do it kind of advice? Yeah. I mean, I guess you'd have to ask them um, to see how much they're looking at me, but like, I'm just trying to help them out. Like you said, I've, um, it sounds, you know, it's, it, I feel weird saying it, but I have been around for a, a decent amount of time now. And like you said, I've kind of, you know, um, played full time in the NHL. I've been the extra guy in the NHL. I've kind of scratched and clawed to stay in there as long as I could. And, and obviously I'm proud of that, but you know, it's not easy. And, um, played many years in the American league as well. Last year played in Europe. So I've kind of bounced around a lot. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I just want to, uh, be kind of the older guy on the back end this year. We've got a lot of good, um, young defensive prospects, um and guys that have even played a couple years in the american league um that are good players and you know it's hard it's you know uh springfield's a great place but nobody wants to be in the american league you know as a hockey player you want to be in this case in st louis and um you know we've got a great setup and we're very fortunate to be playing in springfield but it is hard whenever you're you know watching the blues game every night thinking what do i got to do to get up there type of thing and and for myself i I've been through that before. I know how it feels. I know how impatient you are. And, um, you know, sometimes the organization just has a different plan. Um, you don't want to rush guys, especially nowadays when the game's so fast. Um, you want to make sure that when you're calling your young guys up, that they're ready and that they're going to um, flourish and, and that they're prepared. So um, anything I can do to help those guys, that's why I'm here and, and I'm happy to do so. Um, so, you know, like I said, we've, We've got good prospects. They've really got their heads on their shoulders. I don't know how much, um, you know, they need to listen to me talk, but I just try and go to the rink every day and kind of, you know, lead by example. I know it's a cliche, but just kind of, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to play with a lot of good players over the years and, and kind of be a um, fly on the wall and see what they do day to day. So that's just, I try and bring all that every day and, and hopefully be a good example. And, and obviously if, be someone that they can bounce some questions off if they have some. We're talking with Scott Harrington, defenseman for your Springfield Thunderbirds. Um, and I, I have a two-parter because I know you did play in, in Switzerland last year. First of all, is Switzerland as beautiful as it looks on the postcards? Because it looks like it's absolutely gorgeous there. And if you are one of these young players, and I know we have a lot of young foreign players, I, as someone who can't skate, I assume that the difference in the size of the ice, especially for defensemen, is maybe one of the biggest adjustments. Is is that it, or is there something else that's really different about the European style that can be challenging when you do when you come to to America? No, I think that's right. I mean, well, first of all, yes, it, it might be more beautiful than the postcards. Um, incredible! So very fortunate that I got that opportunity. Um, it, yeah, it's it's different. It's hard. Like, you know, I played over ten years pro whenever I went to Switzerland last year, and it took me like 
you know, it, it takes you a couple months to get used to the game. And I was used to the pro game, but it's just different. And it, like you said, it's really, the, I think the size of the ice is obviously the biggest factor in the difference in the game. And then I think from there, just everything changes the style. Um, defending is difficult. I found over there, because you can't close on guys as quickly because they have the rink is wider. And on the flip side, it is easier whenever you have the puck because you have more time. You can curl back, you know, as you guys see it, um, you know, some of the European guys uh, that we have on our team, they just move the puck so well. So I think that in speaking with some of them, I can now kind of relate to them. Like it's, it was a bit of an adjustment for myself coming back this year to the North American style. I even, uh, I only played one year, just having to, move the puck quicker, be ready, you know, knowing what you're going to do with the puck whenever you get it. Um, and then just having, just feeling like there's not as much room out there. It It's hard. There's pros and cons to everything, but um, that, you know, I can certainly sympathize with those guys coming over here because I know it is an adjustment. I think our guys have done, the guys from Europe that have come over have done a really good job adjusting. I think that they've, um, you know, taken that step and, and seem to have, um, gotten used to things quickly and they're doing a great job out there. So that's, that's helped us out a lot. Hmm. So Scott, you're new to Springfield. Tell us a little bit about you as, as from a defensive group, right? I think that it's, it's interesting. I was looking, breaking the guys down and, and you've got like four really young guys, Johannes and Lou, Butchinger, Marc-Andre Gaudet. There's you, there's Skinner, Schooneman, Tucker. Those are like the guys that have been around and you have some, offensive minded defensive players being new to Springfield. Tell us what sort of what's your game like and how do you sort of fit in with some of these D pairings? Do you know if, if Connor Walchuk, is he looking to pair you up with a young guy to steady the back line a little bit? How's that dynamic? Um, he hasn't specifically said, um, you know, wouldn't surprise me. I know that, line pairings and defensive pairings change nightly, but mm. it wouldn't surprise me if maybe that's what they were kind of um, trying to do, at least at the beginning of the season until they figure out chemistry and everything. Um, you know, as one of the other guys, I played with Boots the first two games, and, um, and he's such a dynamic player, can skate so well. You know, you want to have the puck in his hands as much as possible. So for someone like myself, I'm just trying to support him as best as I can and um, talk to him is a big thing that uh, – um, our coaches have talked about just communication with the younger guys. And, um, you know, the more you can communicate, the more comfortable they're going to feel. And, and, and obviously the quicker you, you would build chemistry with your partner. So um, myself, my game, <clears throat> I'd say my strengths are my defensive play, um, you know, eliminating time and space, moving the puck, breaking the puck out of the D zone, penalty kill, things like that. Um, but I am looking to jump up and support the rush. I'm, I'm probably not going to be the one leading the rush most of the time, but as a, you know, second, third, fourth player up the rush, mm -hmm. I think that's important. Just the game, the way that it's played nowadays, everyone has to be comfortable in that position. And, um, you know, especially just breaking the puck out of the D zone, jumping up kind of sometimes into the high slot to get a pass from the half wall, just to be an option to, to get the puck out of the zone. Um, you know, that's something that was, really hammered into us whenever I was in Columbus. We really use that um, almost every breakout. So that's just kind of where the game has gone. And um, so, yeah, I'm someone that I'm looking to, to support the rush and, and kind of use my skating whenever there's an opportunity. And first and foremost, just taking care of things in our end and, and supporting my partner. And, and if it's someone that's more offensively inclined, then, you know, just kind of maybe being the safer out of the two partners to let them kind of do their thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. This is um, Scott Harrington, defenseman for your Thunderbirds. And um, Scott, one of the things I, I assume you weren't following uh, Thunderbirds closely last year. Why would you? Um, but when, you know, we started off with Drew Bannister as our head coach, he got called up mid season and down here, things kind of sort of went off the rails. I think when we look at what this team couldn't do successfully down the stretch, it all kind of went back to Bannister leaving and having an interim coach. And so I think as fans, we were really excited for Steve Connor Walchuk because I it's it's fresh, he's interesting, he he came off really professional. And so I'm wondering, as a guy who's had uh, as many coaches as you have, what are you th your thoughts so far on Steve Connor Walchuk's systems, his practice, you know, his routines, uh, how he handles himself in the locker room? 
because I think this is his first AHL gig. So what uh, what are some of your first impressions of of him as a coach and the whole staff? You know, I think it's been really great. I think that, <clears throat> sorry, um, anytime you get a completely new staff, they're going to be coming in with a lot of energy, a lot of excitement. Um, I'm kind of in the same boat as my first time playing in Springfield, which I think is, you know, for me personally, great too, coming in with a lot of excitement. Um, but the coaching staff's been great. They've been good communicators. Um, something I like about them is that they demand, you know, there's a certain um, level of competitiveness and, uh, you know, a certain way that we want to play. And we're still working on that, like a certain identity. You know, we're still working on that. We're not there yet, but, you know, it, it takes time and, and, you know, with practices and trying to get the most out of every practice. And something I like about our staff is that, you know, they, they're they holding us accountable, but at the same time, they're not yellers. They're not screamers. They're not, uh, you know, taking the creativity of the young players' hands. I think that sometimes if you have a coach that's, you know, scaring the young guys so much that they're afraid to make a mistake, then, you know, it's going to take away some of that development and development. And I mean, the American league is a development league. So there's definitely a fine line, you know, you're, you, you, you need to be hard on players sometimes when it's appropriate. So they learn how to, you know, play the right way and have the right um, identity as a hockey player and as a hockey team. But um, they seem to just have a really good grasp of like that balance of like, understanding like the situation that they're in being the American hockey league and that they are tasked with developing the next wave of St. Louis blues players. And, um, that's what we're all here to do. You know, myself as one of the older guys, um, I'm here to play hockey, but I'm also, you know, part of the leadership group that's here to help develop the young guys. So, um, you know, it's just been really good communication so far. Everyone's, um, a lot of excitement at the rank. Everyone's all, you can tell just excited to be there, obviously. And, you know, we're not satisfied by any means with, um, our record right now, there's there's definitely some good things, but some areas we need to clean up. But um, you know, it, it's important that we at least have the energy and the excitement coming to the rink every day, players and staff, and you know everyone just wants to get better. And um, yeah, we're we're gonna head in the right dire- the, the right direction. And um, yeah, it's 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 been a good start, I think, for everyone. Hmm. That's awesome. Good to hear, Scott. You mentioned like PK being a strength of your game can you talk like let us know this the strategy involved in a pk what are you where are you positioning yourself are you guys it it seems like you've kind of been in a bit of a like a diamond shape um what are you really trying to accomplish you're just trying to keep the puck as far away around the perimeter as possible um you know and, and let us know like what what's the strategy through the neutral zone because obviously we want to try to make that as challenging to enter the the zone as possible so kind of what are you guys doing there yeah definitely um you're right i'll start through the neutral zone yeah we you know we want modes um modes your defensive coach he's he's obviously played a long time had a great career Mm -hmm. um and a successful coaching career so we're lucky to have someone with that knowledge on the back end um and i think that you know our our thought process through the neutral zone is to um, try and hold our blue line as as long as we can so that they can't skate the puck in. If they're going to get into our zone, it's got to be off a pass. Mm -hmm. And then once that pass comes, that kind of initiates our pressure. And then there should be whoever's on the side should be pressuring, you know, whichever side the puck's on should be pressuring that guy. And then that kind of activates the other three guys. So, um, you know, it's it's tough. You know, you're playing against the other team's most skilled players. It's not going to be perfect every time. But, um, you know, we're just trying to stay as, I guess, far up the ice as we can without giving up a stretch pass or something like that and just try and get the puck out of their hands, make them maybe chip it in, and then we can kind of go and hopefully disrupt things. And then, you know, in the, the D zone, it kind of varies on what the other team's doing. Oftentimes, it will look like a diamond, like you're saying, and um, something that – our coaches have um, kind of uh, the terminology they like to use is that we're kind of, everyone's kind of has like a, they're guarding two players because we're obviously we're short of person. So you're, like you said, you're kind of trying to keep the puck around the outside. You don't want any passes through the box. We would call it, you know, through the zone to the other side. Cause obviously, you know, that's harder for the goalie to then readjust and get over and is more dangerous. So just trying to keep the puck on the perimeter. You're, you've kind of, 
depending on what situation you're playing, you kind of have two guys that you're keeping an eye on for the most part. So, you know, trying to maybe keep yourself between the two of them or, um, you know, at least take away the more dangerous of the two and then rely on your teammates. So it's really about um, kind of about smarting the other team and being patient and mm -hmm. just having sticks in good places to try and um, keep their passes on the outside is, is the biggest thing. This is uh, Scott Harrington from your uh, Springfield Thunderbirds defenseman. Um, I'm switching gears a little bit here, and, and we were actually just talking about, you know, guys like yourself, Tyler Tucker, uh, Nikita Alexandrov, um, you know, spent more time in the NHL. And then you have these young kids from Europe and juniors, and, and everybody's here together. And I don't know when the last time was really any of you guys actually played a three and three. And I know that that's taxing. And, you know, I, I look at, I mean, I'm watching the, the Providence game, you know, you guys lose three, nothing and everyone just kind of looked a step slower. And I think the guys aren't used to the three and three. Do you have any secrets over the years or any methods or just ways that you're able to keep your body right, your mind right? Um, when you do have these long weekends, three games, probably some travel involved, you know, what's, what's sort of the, the, the best method of, of make, keeping yourself as sharp as possible. Well, we're, we're spoiled here. We've got, you know, great support staff, um, athletic therapists, strength coaches that, you know, keep us in tip top shape. They've got a lot of, um, you know, hy hydration, supplements, vitamins, basically everything that we need from a physical standpoint to kind of stay ready. A lot of guys are hitting the cold tub between games as much as they can kind of stay loose. I mean, there's only so much you can do. It, the reality is three and three, it's going to be tough. Your legs are going to be heavy by the third game. You know, I guess it, really comes back to, you know, conditioning that you do in the summer. And that is a team we do during the season. And, and that kind of falls on our trainers and our coaches to make sure that we stay in shape. And, um, you know, they do a good job of that, obviously. And I mean, mentally, yeah, you're, you're tired, sure, by the third game. But I mean, once you kind of get in the rhythm, like if, if you're playing the second game in a back to back, you feel better because you've just played the night before you're already in that game mindset you know you haven't waited since it's not friday and you haven't waited since the previous sunday since you last played a game you know you kind of just step right into it so you just try and keep that momentum going if you've got three games through all three of them um and then you know the, on the mental side it's, it's really just pushing yourselves and you know deciding that you're not going to let being tired affect you as a team and you know pushing through that and then whenever you get those victories they're big moral victories for the team as well um yeah. So they're important. I know it's tough. It's it's not easy, and, and the older you get, the harder it gets. But um, you know, it is what it is. That's that's the reality of the American League. So everyone's in the same boat. So you just kind of have to um, roll do the best you can. Yeah, roll with it exactly. Yeah. Scott, I kind of have one one last question for you here. Thank you for your time. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys will have scattering reports on opposing goalies. You know, learn tendencies of different goalies. As a defenseman, are you do you position yourself or do you play a little a different style sort of depending on who the goaltender is here in Springfield? We have two good goaltenders in Ellis and Zarenko. You know, you've played with a lot of good goaltending throughout your career. Do certain goalies like their defensemen to play pucks a certain way, you know, clear the puck a certain way, play it into the corner a certain way? Are, are there goaltenders that like their defensemen to help them as much as they can? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm just trying to think, you know, it's so early in the season. I don't know if we've really gotten into a lot of that, you know, the individual um, tendencies of our goalies. We do a lot of work with our goaltending coach. And, and I mean, he, the goalies are working with him every day before and yeah. after practice. Um, as defensemen, we'll get together a couple times a week with the goalies and just work on um, goalie handles. So they'll, you know, dump a puck into the goalie and the defenseman will go back and then the goalie will have to, you know, work on reads um, which player to give it to where is the player where do they want the puck stuff like that so that in the game it's kind of second nature and, and we're mm -hmm. fortunate what i've seen top to bottom through the blues organization is all the goalies seem to be able to handle the puck really well which is a dream yeah. for defensemen it's like having another d back there <laughs> means sure. we're getting hit a lot less on these three and threes like we were talking about um and we're just getting the puck out of our zone is you know quicker than than normal um you know i think gone are the days of the goalie just rimming it on their forehand up the glass as hard as they can every time they get the puck. You know, you could 
send all 10 guys over there against the glass because you knew that's where the puck was going every time. So it's, it's really is um, helpful and um, it's a great tool for us having goalies that can play the puck. And then, you know, besides that, they're talking to us. Maybe it's on the PK or something like that and we're screening them um, in a situation like that. They're, they're constantly talking to us. But besides that, um, you know, it's just still early in the season. Sure, sure. Um, Scott, one last question for me. It's a, it's a little different. I, I sort of put you on the spot, but you know, 255 NHL games, you've, you just finished, um, wrapped up game number 200 of your AHL career. Uh, do you have any good referee stories or, or maybe a referee that you either had a good relationship with or a bad relationship with, or I, I always, the, the, the player referee dynamic to me is fascinating. I don't think people realize how much communication there is. Um, and you know, Wes, you know, Wes and, and Terry Koharski and those guys just love to, to talk. So I'm just wondering if you had any good, a good story mm. from, or maybe just a ref that you really liked, or you looked at the, the sheet and said, yes, I'm so glad this guy. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I've had any, like too many, like interesting run-ins with refs usually get along pretty well, but it's funny. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm only 31 and this is like happened a couple years ago, but um, some of the guys that I played junior hockey with had decided to um, pursue refing, um, you know, post hockey. And they had played, you know, one of my friends played in Hartford for many years. He was a defenseman and then he, you know, he retired. And then, um, you know, we were super close in junior and kind of not lost touch, but hadn't checked in with him in a while. And then I remember I was playing, I think it was in Washington and go to start the game before the anthem. And then my friend skated by me in a linesman's uniform and he was lining that game and i did like a triple take i was like I, I couldn't believe it that he was now a linesman and that's happened there's i think there's i mean there's probably three or four guys that i played junior hockey with that are either linesmen or ref now um in the american league and the national league so that's just fun for me i mean it, i'm not that is interesting of a story i guess but for me to see like one of my old friends out there you know when we're there's a scrum in front of my friends breaking up a fight or something like that that's that's kind of cool i don't just i guess you it's cool that you've been around long enough that um you know some of your friends are now linesmen or they're, they're officials in the the nhl so that's been cool um like i said there's probably three or four so i don't haven't had too many crazy run-ins with refs but um Whenever they you ever uh, your face, blow a whistle on you, and you just chirp at them, you know, ah, that's why you couldn't hack it. That's, you know, <laughs> no, never. <laughs> <laughs> but on that, it was funny because because uh, I'm the the PA announcer for the for Springfield, and so I looked at the roster and I saw Dylan Blue Juice was a linesman this past weekend, and I remember him playing in I think it was Syracuse. He he played in Syracuse for a while, and wow. um, yeah, you know, we've, we've we've talked to um Casey Terreri. And he t and we asked him about how young everybody's getting. The refs are getting younger. There are guys that, like you're talking about, that play, and they say, you know, rather than playing the ECHL for five more years, let me spend the next thirty refing. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like I don't know if just with the age groups. There's a lot of turnover the last couple of years, but I mean, those all those guys that I used to play with, like from the time they started refing school until the time they were refing HL and NHL games, it was like two years maybe which i don't i'm not saying you know me that sounds bad um but no they i mean they do a good job but if you can stand out amongst that crop i mean you can just skyrocket right to the top two leagues um in no time at all so i mean good for them you're right it's you can do that forever as long as you can skate so it's a cool way to stay in the game for sure and i have to say steve i noticed your shirt um you'll you'll appreciate this someone's been listening to our conversation oh, oh <laughs> sam my man like How are you, bud? sam's he, yeah he's got <laughs> sam, sam moved in about two weeks ago and he won't leave now yeah. he's been staying with my wife and i until his apartment's ready so he's he's eager to listen in on the conversation i think listen boy hey i need that shirt steve yeah well, i'll get you one i'll get uh, you one i'm gonna send one out to moscow too <laughs> we're gonna get everyone's good yeah, we're great. Yeah. We're great. Scott, I can't believe you kept Sam uh, quiet this whole time. I don't know how you did that. Yeah. My wife made these Rice Krispies, and, and been... Sam's just picking at them the whole time on the <laughs> off camera. <laughs> I said, I, I feel like Aaron Rodgers with Devontae Adams over my shoulder. There you go. 
not quite the same reveal, but oh, maybe the Thunderbird yeah. fans will think so. That's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. That's funny. Well, uh, Scott, we really appreciate the time. Thank you, Sam, for the cameo. We appreciate you, brother. Come on anytime. Um, hit me up, Sam. You're more, more than welcome. Uh, best of luck. Rest up. Hope to uh, see you back on the ice soon. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time tonight. Of course. Yeah, good talking to you guys. That was fun. Yeah, cool. take care. You Thank too. You. See you guys. All right, there goes Scott Harrington, a defenseman for your Springfield Thunderbirds. It is uh, great to have him in town. Uh, super chill guy. That was a that was a great conversation. And I, if you're a yeah. young guy, especially on the back end in that locker room, how could you not like having that guy in there with you? I mean, that's that was great. Just by his presence, his answers, you know, you can tell. Uh, not surprised how he earned the A in, with such a short time here. Um, you know, and and we're happy to happy to have him here in Springfield. Rest up and. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see him soon on the ice. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned that too, because I think, I don't want to say I was surprised, but when I saw he got the A, you know, I usually there's enough guys here on this roster who've mm -hmm. been here long enough. And again, they're younger guys, right? But like mm -hmm. they've been here to have somebody come in through free agency and immediately get the A. Not that I was good, bad, or indifferent. I just sure. it sort of, sort of made me tilt my head a little bit. Like, oh, I didn't realize he was that, you know, that, the uh, important to the locker room, I guess, you know, for lack of a lack of a functioning brain that I have. So I thought that was great. I mean, after talking to him, you, you really get it. You understand why, uh, why he does have that a on his sweater and yeah, hopefully we can get him back on the ice soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have the, uh, the, the shutout game uh, three, nothing against Providence. I don't really want to spend too much time on it. I mean, it, it is exactly what it is. I mentioned it to Scott and about, you know, the back end of a three on three, it, even before the interview, I mentioned, I, I just think that this is something these guys are going to have to get mm -hmm. used to. These European players are going to have to get used to these former NHL guys who were playing every other night. You know, when you're, you go from playing Sunday, you know, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. And even Scott talked about that briefly. Like if you, you have a game Friday, but you haven't played since the previous Sunday. Yeah. You've know, you got to get used to that. Whereas in the NHL, again, like I said, it's like it's Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Monday, Wednesday. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's way more consistent. Um, and I, I think that I, I just think it's going to take this team a little bit of time to um, to sort of figure that out, uh, how to do that. Um, also, shout out to Sam Bitten. What's up, Sam? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. That, that, re that really was, you know, uh, Devontae Adams. Uh, oh, man. Aaron Rodgers moment there. That was pretty cool. That was awesome. Uh, all right. So you want to go to the, I know we still have a couple of the fan rants. Um, and I know that a lot of your fan rants, uh, you out there, you, the listener was actually um, Matt, while you're looking at it, I want to wonder if you mm -hmm. can start with Paul's. Um, but while you're looking that up, a lot of the fan rants were about flow hockey. I don't want to just sit here and read nine straight Facebook messages about how you much, how disappointed you were in flow hockey. I think we kind of covered that guys. So if we're not reading it, it's not that we don't care. Um, we've already mentioned Al Armand's name's tw name twice, and he's not even getting a, getting paid every time his name is mentioned. So there's no real re reason to say it again. Um, but he has been – Al's been very vocal about his displeasure with flow hockey, and I get it. So let's not spend the whole time whining, complaining about flow hockey. But we did also have some other interesting stuff in there as well. Yeah, so um, our friend Sam Robinson um, – curious or, or her her rant was um ellis two nights in a row and i think we kind of touched upon that i think we have two solid goaltending solid goaltenders and might just be rolling with the hot hand um i don't think it was an injury to z he was dressed on the bench uh sunday but coming off of a very good performance saturday night in the thunderdome hey you roll with colton ellis two nights in a row. He's capable. He's able. I don't think it's something that you necessarily want to do every three and three, but you know, every roll with the hot hand. And I think last year we just got so used to seeing a new goaltender every night. Um, whether, you know, we started with Subban and Z Subban and Z, and then it was all three of them um, until Subban got traded rotating, you know, Connor Walchuk might just be saying, "Hey, rolling with the hot hand, and let's see, let's see where we go from there." So I, I don't, I don't want to read too much into that um, right away. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that you mentioned last year because I, I think we need to remember that even last year, Zarenko was an every other night guy. 
Mm -hmm. right? So like he never, you know, 2022, 23, his first year, he played 25 games last year. He played 29. So like, that's not, and, and, you know, he still battled injuries. He still right. kind of had stretches where he looked a little fatigued. So why not? If you got the two body, the, there's no magic rule book. There's no Holy hockey Bible that says Zarenko has to play every other game. So I say, why not? Why not? Let, let Ellis have a couple games and next three and three, maybe it goes the other way and whatever. Roll with it. Mm-hmm. See what you got. Yeah. Do you want to take the um a Paul? Yeah, Paul I just don't have it. In, I just don't have it in front of me. Do you mind? I'll, I'll read it, it here um for you because I know you wanted to comment on this. So yes, um, fan Paul Paul Bowler uh comments on the on ice officials. Um, he's been listening to the Chirping Zebras podcast with Mark Riley and Gino Binda. Uh, they've really opened his eyes to how bad on ice officiating has gone down. Quality of the last five to ten years with old school refs and linemen having retired and being replaced with players no longer playing kind of talking just about what Scott was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So Paul, first of all, thank you because uh, last night I was up way too late listening to the (laughs) chirp chirping zebras podcast. And I'm not asking everyone to turn off our podcast and go listen to theirs. But if you want something interesting, really interesting to listen to fascinated, I was fascinated Mm -hmm. every other, you know, be careful. Every other words in F bomb. You know, it's not like a clean, wholesome family fun like we have here at Shake, Rattle, and Goal. But I listened to the interview with those two guys and Terry Koharski. And I love, I know how people in Springfield feel about Terry Koharski. I loved Terry Koharski. I would purposely say his name last and loud and slow just so the booze <laughs> would rain down. And nobody loved that more than Terry Koharski. Um, the stories were just were f- phenomenal and I, again i'm not even a podcast guy we have a podcast i don't listen to podcasts i listen to our podcast i don't mm-hmm. i listen to sports talk radio i don't do podcasts f- absolutely um fantastic and, and like paul said i did learn a lot so yeah it, it's an interesting dynamic to think about the old school way that these guys as these guys were telling these old stories i'm sitting here thinking to myself well that's not how it works anymore you know just this younger generation right in the millennial and mm-hmm. gen what well, i don't even know what is it now gen z whatever, whatever, whatever it is right yeah I don't know. um you know, you can't talk to them the way you could talk to hockey players in the nineties. You think you just, they can't handle it. And, and you're going to be reported and fired. And that guy said something mean to me. Right. Um, what Wes McCauley is, is sort of a, a, a unicorn in that aspect where he's still out there calling games. Like it's the eighties and interacting with players. Like it's the eighties. Right. Um, so thank you, Paul. I want to say thank you to Paul for putting that podcast on my radar because I uh, was fascinated, absolutely fascinated, and it's available wherever. So once you're done with us, listen to us first, then check out the Chirping Zebras podcast. Do you think, and and I wonder if the AHL, like as as they continue to progress their league, like I feel like bad calls happen all over the place. And now we do live in a world where it's no longer acceptable for officials to be bad because now all the other major sport leagues have adopted replay and, and you can challenge a call. You don't have that capability with the AHL. So I wonder how much of that also plays into, and, and look there, there's a reason why they're not, not knocking our buddy Casey Terreri or any, you know, right. But they're in the AHL as an official, it's the same thing, right? Like you're, it's a development referee league too. You want to get to the NHL, but you know, I wonder if the AHL, I'm sure it would cost a lot of money, but you know, maybe use some of the flow sports revenue to look into creating a more, even just better camera angles yeah. for goals. Yeah, How many just, times did we, we had a, a few times last year alone where, you know, you're looking at this puck that did or didn't cross the goal line, but there's no camera angle because there's, there's only one camera angle and they have one iPad that, yeah. you know, poor resolution on it and they have no idea. So the bad call stands and it, it it's not to their advantage that we live in a world now where we want replays to get things right. Like growing up, Steve, I mean, I, I, I am old school in a sense that I tend even in baseball and, and football, like part of the joy, the despair of being a fan of a sport was knowing that at any moment a ref could make a bad call and it was part of the game. Now that's gone. You challenge a play, you, you have it replayed and they get the call, right? Good thing. Do they? So I mean, that's the, that's the intent. I mean, that's the intent. intent. But but like when I look across all sports, replay has not fixed bad calls. 
it's it's now we're now we're going frame by frame. Well, looks like a blade of grass that was right. Out well, of yes, may have yeah. touched the heel of his. Just play football. Just play basketball. And, and to, to expect refs in any sport to to bat a thousand is absurd. We don't expect baseball players to bat a thousand. You expect the umpire to be right. perfect behind the plate. It, yeah. Like, well, that's that's what I mean, though. But that that's as a fan, though, that's what we have become to expect. I mean, I'm of the old school mind where I want I want a bad call to be part of the experience. Hopefully that bad call works in my team's favor, but it's part of the experience of being a fan. I think we people society live. We we have an expectation of. You can't get a call wrong because there's replay and you have to then fix it, but that's not even a a reality in the AHL. So a bad call is going to be a bad call. Yeah. And, and I mean, a lot of the stuff that I think we would consider to be bad calls aren't reviewable necessarily. Like guy gets, guy gets high stick behind the play. You can't review that. You know? Yeah. yeah um, so I, I don't think, I don't think it's this new wave of refs make bad calls. I think bad calls were always happening. Not, mm-hmm. not I don't want to say bad calls, good calls and bad calls together combined questionable yep. calls have all have been happening since the beginning of sports. Now we have, Super duper slow mo, high resolution that gets sent in a tweet that's liked by five million people, and now this ref sucks. We need to go to his house and, <laughs> and rip his house down. Like that wasn't that wasn't happening in 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 the day. And it's funny in that right. podcast, Barry Koharski says something along the lines of he's, they were talked about like what do you do when you know you make a bad call, and he says I don't necessarily bring it up, but if the coach brings it up, you say, yeah, I, I, kill it, my bad, kill it. It's two minutes. I made a bad call. It's only going to cost you two minutes. Kill the penalty and go out there and score. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. You know, and like, and so like, that's, that's what I think is missing. Whereas now with the replay, we're, as they say, circumcising the mosquito to the point where you have, you're so, oh my God, the frame by frame in every sport. I just, I right. can't, it drives me nuts. And like I said, you don't expect your point guard to shoot 20 for 20 and you don't expect your quarterback to throw 35 or 35 completions, but we expect the refs to get every single solitary call. Right. I think that's a little I just think it's like, I don't know, disingenuous. I just, I, it's not going to happen. And and I just don't think replay. I just, I hate replay. I really do. I hate it. Just play. That's what makes sports fun is that is you I'm, win. I'm, and you old, I'm old school in that way. I'm with you. Like, like don't that. make excuses. A bad call is going to be a bad call for us. It's going to be a bad call for the other team. Right. Just play. And, and, right. and, I, and I, I am old school with that mentality. Um, but even coaching I, my, my U10 boys soccer team, I, it's, it's, even the little kids are like, yeah, it, it's not how we're wired anymore. Yeah. But. And and I do think that there are still some old school refs. I mean, we had Bo Halkidis in. Um, I think Jim Curtin is still an old school ref. I think that that Casey Terreri is old school. I mean, you asked about it. What do you think about fighting? He says he loves it. You know what I mean? Like that's, I do think there are younger guys that have that old school mentality. And again, they went to refing clinics that were taught by guys like Terry Koharski, Gino Binda. So like, they they're getting taught the old school way from old school refs, which I think is good for the mm-hmm. sport, but yes, it's fast. It's quick. Things happen. You can't be seeing everything all at once. Um, refs have to work as a, as a tandem. They have to work it really as a foursome. They need to all be on the same page and sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they don't. That's what makes sports sports. That's why we, that's why we do it. Agreed. Agreed. Um, totally flip the subject here, yeah. but, um, Long overdue to say congratulations to our captain, Matthew Pekka, on his 500th career game um, this past Saturday in the Thunderdome. Uh, what a fantastic career. I, I remember first hearing about Matthew Pekka um, at Quinnipiac, right, where that I grew up in Hamden, Connecticut. Um, and and, it, and he, this was like, I this this kid is living in my town. Like, it, it just phenomenal. And, and what he was able to do on the ice there. Uh, for QU and and seeing him now uh, later in his career here in Springfield has been wonderful. It's come full circle for me as a fan. So congratulations to you, Matthew. Captain Pekka, 500 career games. Well done. And I don't want to take up time on it, but man, that team was loaded. Those teams, those Quinnipiac teams with him and Annis and Connor Clifton and Devon Cave, they were Travis St. Dennis. They were just they were just loaded. It's too bad he, he never got one, but yeah, it was nice hearing him talk about the QU win when we had him on the podcast yeah, last year. Yeah. Um, but yes, good dude. I echo all that. I'm, it's, I'm glad he's the captain here. Um, he did mm-hmm. something this weekend. I think it was on the Leo Loof. So Leo Loof got the boarding and 
he went out and he skated over to the ref voluntarily. Luluf was already in the box. And, and I think he was, I don't think he was necessarily apologizing for Leo Luluf. I think he was more saying good call. That was bad contact. At the same time, why are they trying to fight him? It was almost yeah. like he was, he was saying good call. We screwed up. I'm sorry, but they're still acting like, like, you know, jackrabbits here. And, and can you get them to stop, please? Like, we know we screwed yeah. up. Get the, so even just that kind of understanding of how to approach talking to the refs, I loved. So, uh, yeah. yes, I, I'm, I'm thrilled he's here. Congratulations, Cap. Um, anything else? We got anything else on the slate here? I, I, we looked at, we've, we, we, I don't want to take up too much more time talking about next week um, or, or this upcoming right. week, actually, but they do have another three and three, second three and three in two weeks, um, two games home. The first one, October 25th against Grand Rapids. I'm excited for this game. I'm going to this game. Um, we talked about how disappointing the schedule was last year when it was uh, Bridgeport, Hartford, Providence, Bridgeport. Lehigh Valley. And it was just, you know, you're going around in a circle. So very excited to see Grand Rapids. Um, they are right now coming in three and one. This is also a third Jersey night. So uh, I'm expecting the team to look sharp and play sharp. But that is uh, Friday, October 25th, 7.05 puck drop. Saturday, October 26th at home against Hershey Bears. Uh, this is the booze and brews night. Um, wear your costumes, have some beer if you're of age, and cheer on uh, the T-Birds against Hershey Bears. Hershey is coming into this game also at 3-1. and one. Well, as of right now, um, they are 3-1. and one. Um, I, When are they going to fall off? I, I don't know. But hopefully this year. Hopefully starting on Saturday. Uh, okay. Sunday, game number three, October 27th at Hartford. Hartford is coming into the weekend two and one. This is a 305 puck drop on uh, Sunday. And hopefully, Flow TV, Flow Sports, Flow Hockey, Flow Everything is working for this one. Um, so I, I know I will have uh, my TV tuned in just to make sure uh, early. Because if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the, the stream was interrupted right from the beginning. So I'm going to have, I'm going to oh, yeah. try to turn that one on early and uh, know if I'm going to sit through it or not, or we'll find that out. But look, big weekend, Grand Rapids, not necessarily a team. I think they see them three other times this, or, or maybe one other time uh, during the season. Don't know much about them. So I'm, I'm excited to watch Hershey. We know all too well, Hartford, we know all too well. Um, you know, after one win last weekend, I, you need two here. Let's get two. And I, I think going into this weekend, and again, I don't know anything about the situations, but I really hope they get some bodies back. We're very short of the season. You already got Scott Harrington, Hugh McGing, Zach Dean out of the lineup, which means that all these young kids, you're playing these young kids by force, not by choice. Right. So yeah. the more bodies you have healthy for three games, and, and I'm totally cool with that. I mean, if if you're if the roster looks, the, the lineup, if the lineup looks totally different Friday than it does Sunday, I'm cool with that because get these sure. guys – rest you got some fresh legs throw them out there like you know what i mean so um i, I loved what i've seen from taryn pfizer and i think reese newkirk is fine and and you know throw sam get sammy in the lineup we'll get like, sam in there yep um so if you got those fresh legs use them as far as i'm concerned i would so expect, hopefully we can get some healthy guys back i'm with you I, I would expect to let's it would be nice to see sam maybe on that saturday game against hershey again a team we see a lot and you know um and it's booze and brews so you know why not Throw some knuckles in there too. Love it. Love it. Um, so big thank you to Scott Harrington for coming on today. We really appreciate that time. Thanks to Sam Bitten for the cameo. Uh, love that guy. Um, thank you to our sponsors, Landscaping That Fits. Uh, call them for your fall cleanup. Uh, check them out on social media as well. To our buddy, uh, Mike Sarnelli, over there at Brewcade in Agawam. Get some beers. You want some arcade machines? That's your guy to go to. A super fun spot there. And uh, also by our friends at White Lion Brewing, of course. Tower Square in downtown Springfield and out in Amherst. Thank you to all of our sponsors. And thanks to you, the listener, the viewer, the um, viewer. When we see the numbers and the, the interactions on social media, it makes us realize that we're not just sitting here talking to ourselves. So that uh, means a lot to us. We appreciate every single one of you for tuning in. Absolutely. We appreciate we appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, look for another Fan Rant Monday. Love hearing your hot takes and your opinions. Um, and it helps us too. So as always, 
before this three and three. Let's go T-Birds.